Amen. It's good to see each of you this evening. Trust you've had a wonderful afternoon. As we were singing that third hymn, Hiding in Thee, I was just, it was resonating that really Christ is our hiding place in the, in the middle of temptation, in the middle of trial. We need to turn to him and he is our solace. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, again, we are reminded that our need tonight is to know you, to put our trust in you in every circumstance, to abide in you, to hide in you. Lord, remind us of those things, whether it be a preacher seeking your anointing in preaching, whether it be a witness seeking your anointing in bearing the gospel to a neighbor, a relative, or friend, whether it be a particular trial, and there may be some here tonight that, are, that really feel almost like they're drowning. I pray, Father, that they will turn their eyes tonight upon you, upon Jesus Christ, and that you will lift them up. Help each of us, Lord, no matter what our need is tonight, to look to you and to see that you are so much greater than any problem that we will face. And you will carry us through. I pray, Father, that you will give me liberty tonight as we study your word. May you be glorified in all that we do and say. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to, you to turn in your Bibles tonight to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. While you're turning there, I'm going to quote one of the last verses in the book of Galatians. And Paul said this, but God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I unto the world. The cross meant everything to Paul. In fact, the cross really was one of his central themes. And the book of Galatians is about heresy that was going on among the Galatian churches. And it was a heresy that really was so... Um, it was eating at the very heart of the gospel that somebody could be sanctified by their works. And it was even uh, more than that, that they could possibly, that they needed something else besides salvation in Christ. They needed to be circumcised. They needed to follow the law. And Paul argues with him and said, why have you so easily been um, Deceived, having been saved by grace, are you now sanctified by works? And he really sums up the entire book with just that verse. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why is it so hard for people to believe? in the atonement of Jesus Christ. The gospel, which is more than just the atonement, it's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, his deity, but it's all combined in that gospel message. And it is very difficult for people to accept. The cross is a lightning rod 
and always has been since Jesus ascended into heaven. In 1 Corinthians, we find this also being stated again. Look at verse 18 of chapter 1. It says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. I wonder if, if you remember what the main topic of the first three or four chapters of 1 Corinthians is. What was going on in the church? What was the problem that Paul identified in this chapter and in chapter 3? We see it in chapter 2 as well, but also in chapter 3. What was the, real, the main problem? All right, division. Carnality, the carnality was the division. It was, some were saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. And they were jealous of their own teacher and they were lifting themselves up by that following. And so why does, why does Paul bring this message into that problem? For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is the power of God. I believe it is because the gospel, they were, the gospel had not fully impacted their life. They did not see how the gospel fit into humility. The cross is a perfect illustration of, of humbling ourselves, even as Christ did. In fact, Paul, in the book of Philippians, as you know, uses Christ as the example of putting others above themselves. And he says, rather than uh, putting yourself first, have the mind of Christ who thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation. The cross really cuts across the entirety of our human nature. That's why it is bothersome also to unbelievers. When we look at the problems when we deal with problems in our home, maybe with a child who's being stingy or not sharing. Now, we never had any of those problems in our home, but um, what, what do we do? We take them back to the scriptures, don't we? We take them back to Jesus Christ. And then we, we might even use it to just maybe prick their conscience about whether they're even a believer. But the reality is, even as a believer, we can be selfish. But Paul uses the whole idea of the cross as he's talking about um, trusting in ourselves, trusting in our own wisdom, rather than trusting in the Holy Spirit. The cross is contrary to every shred of man's self-righteousness and man's self-sufficiency. In fact, God said, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Friends, this is what solves church problems. <laughs> this is what solves division. This is what solves arguments over petty things. The cross is contrary to every way that man would choose by his own nature and wisdom. In fact, Paul, in the next verse, he says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. And he says, where is the wise? Where is, where is the philosopher? Where is the scribe that 
person who prides himself in the law and keeping the law and teaching the law? Where is the disputer of this age, the debater, that person who wants to use his intellect to argue? And then he says, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Today, in fact, I remember when I was in high school going to a, a church in a neighboring city to watch a debate between three people who believed in creation. They were, they were Christian scientists, not, not of the denomination, but they were scientists who were Christian, okay? And then, uh, and they were debating some secular scientists. And I've seen a number of those and I've watched some of them. And I've never been satisfied with the outcome. Because it's putting, it's putting the two on an equal footing. I believe that's one of the reasons why the Lord has chosen the foolishness of preaching. But the world, through its own wisdom, does not know God. Notice verse 21. He says, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not go know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. No one comes to God by their own wisdom. And the gospel really does, uh, it's, it's in conflict with man's natural wisdom. And he notes that. He says, the Jews request a sign. Greeks seek after wisdom. They, it's, it's like when Paul was in, in Acts chapter 17 and he, was, he saw the, all these Gentiles and Greeks and they were worshiping all these different gods and finally he saw a pedestal or, or something that said to the unknown God in case they had forgotten one. And so Paul stood up and he began to preach to them about the unknown God, the God that they didn't know. And he, what did he do? He preached the gospel. And there were several who were saved. There were, there were those who said, we need to hear more about this. But Paul said, we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, to those who are saved, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. See, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached, the foolishness that man, how, the, how man looks at it, to save those who believe. What is that message? The message is the gospel. The message is Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ. That person is a historical person. And that person is woven throughout the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. And it stands like this boulder, this granite mountain on the landscape of history. And it's what it is. And it isn't going away. You can ignore it. You can hate it. You can pervert it and make it say what you want it to say. You can argue with it, you can get angry with it, you can misquote it, you can say it's not true, but it will not go away. And because of what it is, any honest thinking person must face it and look at it. We have to examine it as a legitimate obstacle to our wisdom because it isn't intuitive to people. It's not intuitive to the way we live our lives and the way we think, whether you're religious or not. The Pharisees had a difficult time with the gospel, didn't they? Even though they were 
particular about the law. And they were considered authorities on knowing the Mosaic law and knowing all the rabbinical teaching. They couldn't, they couldn't deal with the gospel. Because the gospel confronted them with their problem. And it always does. The truth of the Bible has been done more harm, not necessarily by the media or the academic, the intellectuals of our day, but really the gospel has been done uh, has been given more harm from those who actually profess to be religious. By those who call themselves Christians and are not. But true Christianity is miraculous. It is powerful. And it's transformative because it is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And apart from there really are only three options for a person to believe in. First is the gospel of Jesus Christ that claims to be the only way to salvation and eternal life. That is the belief system of what, of, that the Bible teaches. Then there are those Religions that teach that you are saved by self-righteousness and doing good to others to have eternal life and to know God. That is what every other religion in the world teaches. Whether it be Catholicism, whether it be um, some of many of the mainline denominations today who have gone from, uh, from the truth to liberalism where they don't even believe Jesus Christ. They have accepted um, that the Bible is not all true. They've accepted evolution in many cases. They don't believe that Jesus is deity. This would in, include Islam. It would include Mormonism, Hinduism. All of these other religions are different from true Christianity. They're man-made religions that depend on one's self-righteousness to get to heaven and be saved. And then you have only one other option. What would that be? Atheism. There is no God. We live, we die, we are no more. We're just animals. The best we can do is try to live together peaceably, but that hasn't worked too well if that's the case. I was listening to a recording not long ago, which was kind of a biographical um, story about how um, a man back in the late 1700s, early 1800s, how he became a Christian. And he got involved in a conversation with um, a man who was a pastor. And he started debating him on Christianity and the truths of the Bible. And this pastor just came coming back at him with answers, with legitimate answers. And one of the things he said is, I believe, you know, Jesus was a good man, but to accept that he was God? You've often heard of what C.S. Lewis said, that um, you, you can, there's really only three options for who Christ was. He was either a, a deceiver, or he was deluded, or 
he was who he said he was. There's no other option. You can't say he was a good man without saying that he is who he said he was. Because no one else would say that. No one else would claim that. And if they did, we would say they're, they're, they're deluded or else they're a deceiver. Well, this pastor back in the early, in the late 1700s, early 1800s, was telling this, this man the same thing. And it shook his faith. I mean, it sh he didn't have faith. It shook his belief system that he had. And there are many people at the best who believe that Jesus was simply a good person. But that really isn't an option. Just this re week, I've been reading through the Gospel of John. And I wanted to share with you just how clearly Jesus Christ tells these people who he is. And I'd like, you to take, I'd like to take you through some of those scriptures here. And if you would turn to chapter 4. And I'm doing this, again, because of the gospel. And it will become very evident to you that Jesus Christ was telling people who he was and even at times what he would do. In chapter 4, verse 25 and 26, listen to what the Lord said to the, the Samaritan woman at the well. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Turn to chapter 5. Christ heals a paralytic man. And the prob part of the problem with that was that he did it on the Sabbath. But the Jews had a problem with it simply because he, he healed a man because that would cause others to follow him. But look at verse 17 and following. He says, but Jesus answered them, my father has been working until now and I have been working. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father making himself equal with God. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do, for whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For the, as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so, the Son gives life to whom he will. That's an incredible statement. Verse 22, For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. He, he keeps going. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. 
Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Obviously, he is very clear about what he's saying about himself. Look at verse 31. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is true, is not true. But there is another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. You have sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Yet I do not receive the testimony from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. He was not... He was the burning and shining lamp, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than John's. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. And the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form, but you do not have his word abiding in you, because whom he sent, him you do not believe. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive honor from men, but I know you that you do not have the love of God in you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from only God? Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. <laughs> but if you do not believe his writings, how you, will you believe my words? Is there a, any question at all about who he is claiming to be? None. But I want to go a, a little bit further. Look in chapter 6. And he's talking here about being the bread of life. Verse 32 Let me just say in verse 27, he identifies himself as the son of man and he tells them not to labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the son of man will give you because God the father has sent his seal on him. Verse 32, then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven. But my Father gives you the true bread from heaven, for the bread of God is He who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to Him, Lord, give us this bread also. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and, who believes, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. A friend's what would you say if one of the people in our church stood up and said, I am the bread of life? <laughs> yeah, you would, we would shut him down and we'd talk to him about heretical teaching. Let's go a little further. Over in chapter 6, verse 45, I'm going to start halfway ver through verse 45. It says, therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Go over to chapter 7, verse 25. It 
Now some of them from Jerusalem said, Is this not he whom they seek to kill? But look, he speaks boldly, and they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is truly the Christ? However, we know where this man is from, but when the Christ comes, no one knows where he is from. Then Jesus cried out as he taught in the temple, saying, You both know me, and you know where I am from, and I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know, but I know him, for I am from him, and he sent me. Therefore, they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. And many of the people believed in him and said, when the Christ comes, will he do more signs than these which this man has done? Look at verse 37. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Chapter 8, verse 12. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Look at verse 23. And he said to them, you are from beneath, I am from above. You are of, his wor of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Now notice the word he there is in italics. If you take that out, what does it say? <laughs> I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins, which would be, quoting the, New, the, the Old Testament, the name of Jehovah God. And then over to verse 34. Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And look at verse 48. Then the Jews answered and said to him, Do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. And I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Then the Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead and the prophets. And you say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who is dead and the prophets are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to throw at him. Incredible. Look in chapter 9, verse 5. He says, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And this chapter is mainly about him healing a blind man. And I'd like you to look at verse 31 of this chapter. He says, now, we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does, not, does his will, he hears him. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, 
he could do nothing. And this is the, the blind man speaking. And they said, they answered and said to him, you were completely born in sins and are you teaching us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out and when he had found him, he said to him, do you believe in the son of God? He answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, you have both seen him and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. But that's not the end. Go on. And Jesus said, for judgment I have come into the world, into this world, that those who do not see me, I'm sorry, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be, bl may be made blind. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, are we blind also? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remains. What that means, friends, is that those Pharisees heard Jesus when he said to that blind man, he who is talking to you is the Messiah. Go to chapter 10, starting in verse 7. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Look at verse 17. Therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. Friends, in order to say that, you have to know that you have the power to do it. <laughs> Look at verse 17. I'm sorry, not verse 17. Verse 24. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered to them, Many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself God. And then in chapter 11, I'm not going to really take you through that, but that's, that's the story about who? Lazarus. And there were many who were witnesses of this miracle. It's probably, I would say it's the greatest miracle of Jesus' ministry. It was culminating. Just two or three chapters later, Jesus is then in the middle of the last day. I mean, just as he is taken into custody or as he goes to Gethsemane and 
he's praying the high priestly prayer before he's taken into custody. But in this chapter, he says, that's, this is where he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Now, friends, if Christ isn't who he said he was, there's no other possibility than he's a deceiver or he's deluded. That is why for any person, Christ deserves our utmost consideration. There is no way to explain what has happened through Christianity apart from Jesus Christ. There were enough people living that if they did not know that Jesus Christ had resurrected from the dead, they would have known that it was untrue. We can't deny that Jesus said these things. We have over 6,000 manuscripts, some of them dating back to less than a century before, uh, after Christ died. And they all say the same thing. All the copies that have been made down through the centuries, they all say the same thing. There's no question. They've been preserved. But the central theme of all of this is the fact that Jesus came for one reason, and that was to atone for the sins of mankind. But what that does is it takes away all self-righteousness because when we as sinners, and the only way we can come to Christ and be saved is that we see him as the righteous one who took our punishment for us. And we realize that we are the sinners who deserve that punishment. The cross is the central theme of Christ's ministry. He said, this is what I came to do. And it will always be an obstacle to people's belief because man's sinful, man's sin nature is pride. Man's sin nature is to rebel. Man's sin nature is to justify himself by his own self-righteousness. And let me just say that Jesus Christ and the Bible are not afraid of honest investigation. I remember I, I read, can't say I've read the whole Book of Mormon, but I did read part of it. And essentially what the Book of Mormon is, is a history of the North American continent. And there is not any shred of evidence, archeological, scientific, uh, historical documents, there is, there is no shred of evidence to support what it says. But today, the manuscripts that we have of the Bible, archaeologists, when they're trying to find locations, they, they look to the Bible. The Bible is the primary source. It has the names of government officials that lived at specific times that we can actually go back in saved documents, government documents and so forth, and we can actually see that it was true. We have ancient artifacts that show that King David actually lived. <laughs> the Israelites did live in the Holy Land in spite of what Others say, 
The Bible names people groups and names of places. And all of that can be corroborated. That it's true. Hinduism is a mystical religion. If you go into the, the apartment or the home of somebody who follows Hinduism, you'll see pictures of their gods on their, on their walls. Normally, they are women with multiple arms. There, it has no basis in fact. It has no basis in history. It is the imagination of someone. Christianity has all of these things. But even with all of that, somebody can walk away as an unbeliever. Because their heart, their mind, will not repent of their own self-righteousness and their sinfulness. Christianity is not a religion of science, even though it has plenty of science. I'm just saying, I'm not saying it's unscientific, because the Bible is scientific. Everything that it says is true. But I'm saying that principally, the Bible is a book that tells us who we are and who the Savior is and who the real God is. We have many fulfilled prophecies. And all of these proofs the Bible gives us so that we will believe in the Savior who died for us and rose again. That's what John said at the end of the book of John. He said I, many other things he did, but these are given so that you might believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The cross is at the center. The gospel, though, is what you must believe in. Yes, you believe all of the other, but primarily you believe that because you believe in the Savior. And if we don't, then we are in our sin. The gospel strips us of all self-righteousness. I want you to turn to Matthew 16 as we close here tonight. Here in Matthew 16, the Lord had asked the disciples who people say he is. And he, they said some Elijah and others Jeremiah, some John the Baptist. And he said, but who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered and he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And we know what the Lord said about Peter and how the church would be built upon um, his statement of Christ's deity. After that, he told the disciples, now don't tell, tell no one that, he was, that I'm Jesus the Christ. But notice in verse 21, from that time Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. I just want to point out that the principal problem that man has with the cross and with the gospel is that they are mindful of the things of men and not the things of God. They are part of the kingdom of Satan. 
And the strongest rebuke that we have in Scripture came from Jesus Christ when Peter, who was really the head of the disciples, I mean, he partly that was because of his leadership, but when Peter said to the Lord, no, Lord, this, this isn't, this shall never happen to you. And notice what he then said to Peter in verse 24. Then Jesus said to all his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Now, he wasn't saying here that man taking up his cross was going to be his redemption. But he was saying to them, if you're going to follow me, the cross is the central part of my coming. And you've got to follow in the sense that I've got to live the life of the cross. That I will do the will of the Father wherever that takes me. That I will follow Christ. The cross, the gospel, is the primary difference between the truth and error. You know, there are many people who will say, yes, I'm a believer, and... I, I believe in, in what Jesus Christ taught. And what they're, te what they're thinking in their mind is, I, I, I'm thinking about, well, the, the Sermon on the Mount. He just gave so many good principles for life in there. And if I just follow him, I know I'm, I'm going to be righteous enough. I know that he'll save me. But that isn't what the Bible's talking about. You can believe that Jesus Christ is a good teacher if you want, but unless you believe in the gospel and you have personally put your faith and trust in Christ alone for your righteousness and for your atonement, you are not a believer. You are not saved. It is not simply God's teaching that saves us and our, our, that he's a moral person and I'm going to be moral. And I'm going to try to live up to what he said. You will die in your sins if you, if you do that. In fact, that, will not, that not only cannot save us, it actually exacerbates the problem. You deceive yourself. And you deceive others. And what it will do is create Pharisees. And what happened to the Pharisees? They, they were not any more moral than anybody else. But what it did is because they put so much emphasis on the law, they had to cover up what their lives really were. They, they couldn't be transparent about it. And they tried to get rid of anybody who tried to confront them with their sin as they did with Jesus Christ. We don't want to be Pharisees, do we? But friends, sometimes even as believers, we can, we can get into that rut of somehow thinking that, you know, we're living, we're living a, a good life. We're, these things, you know, we're not living like the world does. But we're not really judging our own sin. We're not, we're not letting God deal with even the, the things that are going on in our heart. The gospel is the central theme of the scriptures. The gospel will be the topic of our new song in heaven when we stand around the throne. 
because we will worship him forever because of what he did for us and who he is. If you are questioning, I trust that you will take seriously the words of Jesus Christ. You either have to accept what he said is true or you have to deny it. And there is the other options are error. They are not true. And they cannot give eternal life. Next Sunday night, I'm going to be just following up on uh, the theme of the cross. Again, as we prepare ourselves for Easter and I believe it will help us in, in uh, just considering all that Jesus Christ has done for us. So I hope you'll be here next Sunday night as well. As we close tonight, I think it would be good if we could close with maybe a season of prayer. I believe it would be helpful for us. <laughs> I think we, we are in need of prayer. Uh, I think of what's going on politically right now, and uh, this is a time when God's people need to continue to do what God commanded us to do. But let's pray that God might still continue to give us freedom, and thinking of the Equality Act that is supposed to be coming before the Senate, and I am we need to be praying that that will not be confirmed and asking for God's mercy in that. But let's also pray that the Lord will use us in these times to be the witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I wonder who would maybe pray for us. I was thinking we could have a couple of men that would be willing to pray. Anybody that would like to volunteer? Okay, Larry, somebody else, Solomon, thank you. Okay, and I'll, I'll close. Go ahead. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the reminder, the simple truth of the gospel message tonight. Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice that Jesus made to begin to think and meditate on the upcoming Easter season, Father. We are humbled that you took compassion on us. Hmm. Yes. You know, it is not a message that the world is receptive to. Father, you've given each of us contacts here, friends, family members, co-workers. Lord, I pray that we would be bold in sharing our, our testimony, sharing your faithfulness, sharing the truth of who you are. And Lord, I pray that you would bless that effort, that we would see fruit, uh, and we would see full faith as a result. Father, not for our own pride, but 
pray, Father, for continued boldness for those that are in the minority. We pray for strength. Lord, we pray for uh, others that are elected that we disagree with, Lord, that you would give them wisdom, that you would give them spiritual open, that you would see their, uh, they would see their needs, Father, and they would repent of their wickedness. Lord, I pray, as Brother Larry prayed, that we would be bold and Lord, we thank you for the model that you gave us as you walked on this earth. A model of boldness, a model of honesty, and transparency, and a... Lord, you didn't hold back. You gave people the truth. We thank you for the model of compassion as you dealt with a blind man and as you dealt with the woman at the well Lord, you weren't looking for the elites. You were, you were open, Lord, to whoever. And I pray, Father, that we will be looking in our lives for divine op opportunities, divine appointments all around us. May we trust your Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us and to open our mouths Thank you for the gospel. Father, as was already mentioned, we know that the gospel is not something that most people are thinking about or they're not. It runs against the grain of our human nature. But we pray, Father, that we would go forth in faith that as we give the gospel, you will open hearts and you will challenge hearts that maybe have never thought about it. Help us to plant the seed. Help us to realize that there are those people who are thinking about what, what is coming next. They're fearful. They don't know if they'll have a job. They don't know Any, they don't have any certainty. But Father, to know you is to be secure. So Lord, give us a love for others. Give us a concern for others. And Lord, we do pray for our country. We are grateful for the freedoms that we have enjoyed. We are grateful, Lord, to, for this country. There are many mercies that we have enjoyed here. Father, you have told us to pray for kings and governors and those who are in places of leadership that we may lead a quiet life and peaceable life. And you said that it is not your will that any should perish and that we need to tell them of the Savior who came to save them. Lord, I pray that we will take those opportunities even with our elected officials. And we do pray for this Equality Act that is being promoted. Father, we pray in your mercy that you would uh, strike this down and we would, we would pray that you would keep it from coming up again. We recognize, Lord, that you know what we need. You know what our country needs. You are sovereign. You have told us to come in prayer and seek your face. And Lord, we pray that 
true believers all over this country will seek your face and turn from their wicked way and pray so that you might heal our land. Show us, Lord, examine our hearts. And Lord, I pray for our people here tonight. I just pray that you will send us home with a hunger for your word, a hunger to be filled with your spirit, a desire to be used to bring others to our Savior. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you. You are dismissed.